made you decide to start a band? Because you didn't start for months later. I saw the New York Dolls, we, me and Tommy and Dee would go out, and I saw uh, Johnny Thunders at a club. I thought, wow, this guy looks really cool. And Tommy would go, oh, no, the band is terrible, the worst. I go, no, this guy looks too cool. Uh, he, he has to have something here. I went to see the band. I thought they were really good, really entertaining. I thought, you know, I could do that too. And uh, then all of a sudden I saw Slade right after that, and I thought, whoa, these guys just blew me away. This is tremendous. I probably couldn't be as good as this, but I think I'd be as good as the New York Dolls. Uh, and Tommy kept saying, you and Dee should start a band for two years. He kept telling me and Dee start a band. And then all of a sudden one day I lost my job at work, and I thought, okay, I'm going to start a band now. And that would have been uh, January 74. And did you play instruments? No, I didn't play. But Tommy kept saying, that didn't matter. You, you know, you, you, you'll be good. You know? So what did you do? He knew. <laughs> so me and Dee start a band, and we get uh, Joey into it, and then uh, and eventually we had Tommy. So, uh, so, so what did you do? You just picked up the guitar and started Picked up the guitar and started to play. and. We changed different combinations. First it was me and Dee Dee both playing guitar, and then I made Dee, Dee the, the bass player. I made him the bass player. Joey was the drummer. Tommy suggested making Joey the singer because he wasn't very good at drums. And, uh, and then Tommy was a guitar player, and then we made, eventually made him the drummer. And so I found the right combination. And, and did you all kind of agree on the kind of music you were going to do? Or? We just sat down. We didn't know how to play anyone else's songs because we was learning how to play. I put some records on, we were going to play uh, like Yummy Yummy and things like that. And we were like, well, we, I don't know how to play this. We better write a song that we can play. And we sat there and wrote the, whatever, the first song the first day. And then each day we'd write songs. Basically, that became easy. Right, basically stuff you could do. Yeah. Based on stuff we can do. Uh, play within our limits, within our limitations. So that it didn't, sh so the, inc so the inc early incompetence wouldn't show. We'd play, keep our songs simple. Right, but, and it's funny, that's what got you over in a way, that's what made people yeah. realize. Yeah. You cut it to the core. You yeah. say, this is rock and roll cut to the bone. Right. You know? And rock and roll is always supposed to be about the, it was always about the songs and uh, an image and an energy. And uh, that's what rock and roll, the early days of rock and roll was always about. And that's what about first attracted me to when you first see the Beatles and you first see the Stones and, you know, all, all those bands. So was CBGB's already happening? At that time, or how did you find out about? Uh, it? We started seeing uh, some ads. I think television. Did he knew some uh, Tom Verlaine or Richard Lloyd in television, and they were playing at a place CBGBs, and there was no really no other bands. There was no bands playing original material. So uh, I think we went down there, or you know, or we spoke to television, and we got a job one of the nights. You know, at uh, CBGBs, it's just a little dumpy little bar on the Bowery. No one going to it. We played our show, uh, first show, and I think there was two people in the audience. And uh, what was that show? Well, how, how, how did you perform with that? Oh, I have clips of. I have a, a film of the third show. Um, so embarrassing to look at because I know how we are three months later. But it was the we, you know we're doing the songs. We're doing the you know first album stuff, and the image wasn't quite there yet. We refined it as we looked at the videos, and we started watching ourselves back, we, we corrected the problems. And, and, and what was the audience reaction? The audience, two people. A a Alan Vega from Suicide was one of the two people. He comes over to me and Dee Dee and says, uh, you guys are great. This is, uh, this is like the first show. You guys are great. Uh, this is what I've been waiting for. And I go, Dee, this guy's nuts. If we, can, uh, if we can fool this guy, maybe we can fool a bunch more people, you know, into thinking we're good. So then I started realizing maybe we can stop fooling everyone. So, did you, that when you got the idea, like, okay, we got to get an image and we got to work on that? Or? I was always aware of the image. I mean, you know, I, I just <laughs> I had to watch it back though to make the corrections. I mean, uh, we we knew. See, we were coming out of the glitter period, and we knew uh, glitter was still at its full thing in New York, but we knew that this wasn't going to catch on in the Midwest because not everyone's going to look great in glitter, spandex, and things like that, and you know. So we knew there was a problem, and then we just figured, trying to figure out what's going to look right, you know. And uh, and between you know uh, me and Dee Dee and Tommy, uh, we discussed the image, and uh, we realized um, sneakers were built for speed. We're going to wear sneakers, and then we I'd wear my leather jacket uh, in the daytime, and we, I think we evolved into the jeans and the leather jacket, and just uh, you know. Uh, 
within a, a month or so or two into us playing, you know, we st it evolved. And then we refined it. As soon as we saw the videotape back, then we could say, all right, this is wrong, this is wrong, and let's make the changes. Who was doing the tape? Somebody that was, we played with a theater group, and, uh, and somebody in the theater group said, can I film you guys? You can have the tape. I just want to film it, you know, because you guys, uh, there's something here. And Yeah, sure. Filmed it, gave us the tape, and uh, maybe watch back the video. Well, it really started to click in in uh, the summer of 75 with the CBGB's Rock Festival that they had that was covered by Rolling Stone magazine. And that, <clears throat> that's when it really kicked in. That's when it, now the place is getting packed. Now it's getting full. Rolling Stone covers it. Most of the articles, one-page article, most of the articles on the Ramones. And then Talking Heads and then the other bands were just casually mentioned, you know. And, you know, when you were playing there, did you look around and say, I like these guys. I don't like these guys. Were they oh yeah, I'd, I'd re review everyone. You know, with, who, you know where our competition lied. You know, uh, the Heartbreak was the only other band that I looked upon as uh, these guys are really good, but they're a bunch of junkies. So I don't have to worry about them. Their careers are going to be short. You know, uh, that was the only other band I was concerned about. With you know, that was the next best band. Yeah. Talking Heads were doing something totally different. So it was like you know, didn't concern me. It wasn't really rock and roll. It was something else, you know. And Blondie was just a lightweight pop band, and uh, no one really cared about them at all. Uh, there was open, like an opening act. They become big later on, but uh, right, at the right. time, and the other bands were just, you know. And most of the other bands were a joke to me. The other guys would go out. I would show, play the show, leave, and I never hung out. Uh, to me, it was always. It seemed like a waste of time to sit in a bar every night talking to the same people and, uh, well, they and, and drinking. I don't drink, uh, I, you know, I have one beer, I don't, I don't want to hang out, I'd rather go home watch movies. Or do, do well, they mentioned something about like the Fabulous 50 or fi Fabulous 500. It was like the same group of people going to the shows all the time, right. doing the scene. Right. And, you know, that's all they were doing. Right. That's all they were doing. Yeah, we started, and once we started getting a little popular, then we ain't letting no one in, no one's getting in. <clears throat> we have someone at the door, we're collecting the money, we're not going to be cheated by anyone, we raise the price, uh, each, you know, we go, to, we go to $3, then we go to $4, then we go to $5, uh, it was a business. The first album comes out and we really can't find jobs anywhere, but LA was interested, it's always, with a lot of acts throughout the ages, I know the Rolling Stones when they did their first tour in 64, they did well in New York, they did well in LA, the rest of the country they bombed. Uh, I think the New York Dolls would come out to LA. So we, we knew our stronghold was going to be going to London and going to LA, you know. So where did you play when you went to LA? I think we did, uh, we did the Roxy. That's what we did. We did the Roxy. We did two nights at the Roxy and we did two nights at the Starwood. That was the first trip to LA. I think that was in 76. I remember it was a bootleg record off of that. It was a radio broadcast. That's always good for bootlegs. Um, and the next time through, I think we did like a week at the whiskey or something, you know. What was the reaction from the LA crowds? To oh, great, great, you know, yeah, great. I mean, was stuff. that a shock? I mean, they were like. Well, I don't remember so much the Roxy and Starwood show, but I remember the whiskey show by the following year, and it's like, you know, you, you know, yelling, you know, girls like yeah, explain screaming. You, if you can just get into that a little bit, like playing the whiskey and the crowd going crazy, and, you know. Yeah, it's so long ago. It's so long yeah. ago, you know. We were used to playing shows and everyone just sat there with and not knowing what to, how to react, you know. Reactions got crazy as time went on. But in the beginning, people just sat there in this um, in, in amazement. And, uh, you know, and <laughs> I don't, you know, you don't, looking back, I don't know why, but, uh, you know, that's what that's the reaction was, you know. You never sure if they were liking it, no one would do anything. That's funny. I remember playing Detroit, the whole crowd just sat there and, no one clapped, no one did nothing. And they it's, also, like, it's like the scene in Springtime for Hitler when they... Yeah, <laughs> they right. Bruises, right? And, uh, and then the one person collapsed and everybody hit, hits him. Uh, they sat there and I thought, oh God, the August going to walk out because we had to do two shows. And they all just sat there and waited for an hour for the next show. And they, they sat there and watched the whole show again, you know? So. Well, well, you know, it's interesting talking to you, seeing how, how you, you know, sculpted the sound. It wasn't just something that happened. So the, the, the kind of music and the length of the music, was there, was there a conscious thing to keep the strong, strong, strong? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, 
since we played fast, they were basically regular songs. They would, you know, because we're playing them a little fast, instead of two and a half minutes, they'd come in at two minutes. Um, you know, they'd have their choruses and their, you know, the, the right amount of verses, and you know, in most cases, a bridge. And so they were regular. They were structured like regular songs. Just playing fast, so they get a little short. I had seen the Beatles at Shea Stadium in '65, I believe '65 or '66, and uh, they had played a half-hour show. So I figured, all right, if the Beatles played a half hour at Chase Stadium, the Ramones should only be playing for about 15 minutes, you know. So we kept the set at about 15 minutes then, you know. So uh, I based it on that. That's pretty, that's pretty good value. <laughs> if they get a yeah. half hour, you should get 15 minutes. Yeah. And I always thought, you know, I don't know why bands, especially opening bands, why they'd want to play longer than they have to. Uh, they always want to fight for more time. You're always better off playing shorter. Yeah, let them, let them want more. You get all your best material, you leave them wanting more if you're actually any good, and you don't fill up your over, overdo it with mediocre material. And, and most bands only have a, a song or two that's worthy, worthy anyway. So, But it's true, a lot of times you go see an opening band and like you get into one or two songs and all of a sudden it's like, hey, I want these guys off. Yeah, yeah well, even big bands. I mean, everyone should play, you know, an hour. No one should play more than an hour. Yeah. Definitely, you know, definitely enough. Uh, yeah, people, people have other things to do. I mean, you know, let them go, be entertained for an hour and go do something else. Well, it's something to be said for your best stuff out there. Yeah. Well, you didn't, you know, you really didn't have that many bands. Not like it's not like now. It's flooded with uh, you. You open the LA Weekly and it's just a million clubs and bands all over the place. And uh, then you had to, you got signed. You went on tour with a major group. Uh, there was no clubs to play original material. Clubs were basically for cover bands. So to play cover, uh, to play original material in a club was a whole new thing. So no, no place existed. So, uh, so, you know, right now we have CBGs, it's just a dumpy little bar, but you, you know, we have television, we have Patti Smith, we have the Ramones, uh, and then within the year you have Talking Heads, you have the Heartbreakers, well the Dolls are still playing, but they're falling apart, you know. Uh, this, but there's only a handful of bands, and then when they, once there's a scene starts developing and people are going to see bands, then they start bands, you know? We'd go to towns throughout the country and there'd be no bands, and as we leave each town, bands would form, you know? We have little. kids would see, hey, maybe I can do that too, and, and then all of a sudden you have bands form, you know? And that's how it was everywhere, we, everywhere the Ramones went. We'd go to Lula's towns and play the Lula's places, and bands would form. Are you pretty much happy with the body of work that you did? You know, with all the songs you did, the sound? And, and well, I see I listen to albums and all I hear is the songs I don't like. Uh, I, I expect, I wish they could have all been good. Uh, but you, you understand that you had a huge impact, that it wasn't, it's not just... When, yeah, when I, did, I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 I got to realize that, I got to be, I was been told that. At the time, I, I, you know, I, I, I never thought about this at all until the '90s came in, and all of a sudden, some bands, all of a sudden, bands started. To, we were so in our own world. Bands started telling me this in the '90s. You know, we started playing with Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and right. Rob Zombie and just other people. I started hearing this all the time. You know, uh, you were like the Beatles to a lot of these. Yeah, things. yeah. I, I mean, I realized that uh, we might be. A bigger influence on more bands than than anybody, you know. Uh, I mean, that's weird, you know, because uh, if I start breaking it down into what bands are big influences, some bands, some of the best bands, to me, the greatest uh, American bands, besides us and Beach Boys and Doors, Doors probably weren't really really a big influence on anybody, you know. They're a great band. Zeppelin is a big influence on a lot of people. I don't know how big of an influence the Who are. They're a great band. You're a, you're a Doors fan? You like yeah, them? Doors is one of my favorite. Uh, my Ray fa Ma I just spent the morning with Ray yeah. Manzara. He's the host of the show. Yeah, favorite, favorite, my favorite American band. You know. Yeah. I think the Ramones and the Doors and, and then probably the Beach Boys. I mean, because the Beach Boys, strange. They're, you know, a great group, a lot of great songs, uh, but... Um, their best album is Pet Sounds, which doesn't sound like the, like the Beach Boys. They really basically don't play on their records. The good albums, which is the Beach Boys sound, I mean, aren't very good albums. The early stuff isn't very good albums. There's some good songs here and well, there. The, the songs, I think it goes back to what you yeah. said, Rock and Roll, is about 
good songs. Yeah, but it'll be two or three good songs, and the rest of the songs will be not good. Yeah, um, yeah so yeah, so I, I realized, uh, I, you know, I realized the, the impact that we probably had more of an influence on more people starting bands and doing things than, than yeah. maybe maybe anyone, you know. Yeah. Especially the old '90s generation with the bands. Yeah, yeah. It started somehow in the mid '80s bands, and just picked up from that point on.